dharm and as interesting as his life and work can be profit profitably compared with many of his compatriots in provincial Ireland who emigrated to distant parts of the British Empire, such as Canada, America, and New Zealand, and many of whom can be found represented in government printing offices in these countries. Now, Sharman, like his contemporaries in the Irish printing trade, navigated the severe economic downturn and consequent immigration of the post-Napoleonic world. Now, I'm just going to try and... Oh, here we go. Uh, of the post-Napoleonic world. The tight walls of the 1830s, which was the Irish political rejection of a British tax system that applied only to, to Roman Catholics. Cholera epidemics, which during the 1830s ranged from Sligo to Kilkenny and then reappeared in the 1840s in Kilkenny City. And of course, the Great Irish Famine, which began in late 1845, its devastating um, effects from 1846 to 1852, and then the great cultural, social, and economic readjustment that followed that. Sharman is noted for the steady output of his work for his respective domestic market, one that stretched from the Midwest Irish counties of Carlow and Kilkenny to Clonmel in the south and Waterford City in the east. It included a large uh, Catholic middle class readership. Um, the established local government administration in Kilkenny City and their size meetings, and later antiquarian and scientific societies established in the 1850s and post famine Kilkenny. Kevin, if, if I could just, is, is I could just jump in. For his groundbreaking 1839 commercial Kevin, could I just jump in for a second? Ireland. Um, we can't quite see you in your in your video. Are you able to angle angle your camera down a little bit? That'll be better. Thank you. Okay. Cool. I can't see myself in the corner either because um, yeah. Anyway, um, so he's best remembered today for his uh, his groundbreaking um, directory of uh, South Southeast Ireland. Um, and also for his volume, The Antiquities and Scenery of the County of Kilkenny, um, which was printed on behalf of the Kilkenny Archaeological Society. Now, Sharman's directory is a one-off edition, is wide-ranging in its attempts to cover the main businesses in Southeast Ireland in the towns of Waterford, Kilkenny, Carlow, Clonmel, Carrickon Shore, and New Ross, useful for travellers and travelling commercial traders. In it, for example, we find an extended advertisement by Clonmel printer James Shanley, who a short time later was resident in Melbourne, printing one of the first weekly newspapers and later commercial and religious directories. So Sharman's 1839 directory was a major printing initiative for the period, um, and perhaps given the fluid economic and demographic changes over the next five years, it was one that was not undertaken again. Now, Sharman was descended from uh, Cromwellian settlers who were given confiscated land in Kilkenny in the payment for war services uh, in the wake of the fall of Con Kilkenny during the Cromwellian invasion. And that's very important for establishing his position as uh, a mediator between um, Protestant and Catholic communities. At some point in the early 18th century, one of the family female members, after a dream, uh, as family stories recount, converted to Catholicism along with her children. So there were these close kin connections between local families of both Protestants and Roman Catholics. Thomas Sharman was uh, baptized in Kilkenny in 1874. His father was a wine, uh, wine merchant. Um, and at an early age, uh, Thomas was sent to the Kilkenny printing business um, of the Leinster Journal uh, run by Mr. Patrick Kearney. Now the Leinster Journal circulated widely among Catholics Catholic merchants and uh, the wealthy farming classes uh, in southeast Leinster and East Munster. Um, and as was standard in many provincial towns, Kearney, as a local newspaper owner, consistently acquired the lucrative printing contracts with the Kilkenny Assizes over the years 1803 to 1815, work that was later undertaken by Sharman. Now, Sharman married in Kilkenny in uh, 18. 24 at the age of 30. Unlike his compatriot, um, the printer James Shanley from Clonmel, who over a six year period moved his printing premises four times to various locations in that town, 
Shaman was resident at his res at his rented premises in the main sort of high street in Kilkenny from 1825 until his death 30 years later. So economically, he was um, quite secure. Now, although Kilkenny had a well-developed pockets of wealth and a strong and growing middle class, two thirds of the population of the immediate city were living in poverty in the depressed years leading up to the Great Famine. The Kilkenny population declined from 1823 and, tw and 1821, sorry, 23,000 in 1821, 19,000 in 1841 to 15,000 in 1851 after the famine. That Sharman lived and survived as a commercial printer and publisher through these years deserves some degree of, of investigation and certainly requires us to understand the nature of his publishing output. On the one hand, its high degree of Catholic devotional literature during the worst years of the 1830s and 40s. On the other, consistent county assized publications and then printing carried out for antiquarian members of the Kilkenny Archaeological Society combined with printing for societies such as the Literary and Scientific Institution of Kilkenny and their more prominent um, works for uh, library auction catalogues for, for wealthy patrons. While we are dealing with a printer who printed and published only in English, the main language in Kilkenny and certainly the main language for administrative purposes, Irish was spoken as pr the preferred language in many districts surrounding the city and was still the first language of many well-off farmers in County Kilkenny. It was reported as being the main language on market days within the city in the 1840s, while interpreters were consistently used in the county assizes, though Irish was not used in the printing of the reports from the assize meetings. Further, there is evidence of printed street ballads in Irish um, and bilingual you know, macaronic songs produced by at least one printer in Kilkenny in the late 1830s. Spoken and written Irish was in use and scribal writing was still reasonably common. Perhaps the, worst, uh, the most well-known example being Auli O'Sullivan, um, known in English as Humphrey O'Sullivan. He was a school teacher, diarist, poet, novelist, a collector of scribal manuscripts who lived in Callan, which was about nine miles just south of Kilkenny. Just 14 years older than Sharman, O'Sullivan was a frequent visitor to Kilkenny and Clonmel, and he documented in his Irish language diary kept from 1827 to 35, many of the changing social and cultural patterns of the country people in the counties of Kilkenny and Tipperary, including the increasing number of food riots, the tithe wars, the clandestine, clandestine citizen societies like the white boys, the targeted killings of landowners, um, and then the inroads that English was making in the, county, in the county, especially in the national school system and the, the setting up of circulating libraries in English. And he, he reflects on why, why these can't be set up in Irish. Certainly from the 1830s, there was a major post Tridentine push by the Catholic bishops in Ireland and particularly Bishop William Kinsella, Bishop of um, Ossory, uh, which covered the Kilkenny diocese to stamp out local religious practices, nearly all carried out through Irish and replace them with a the knowledge of basic tenets of Catholicism founded on reading, writing and preaching in English. There appears to be, a, this appears to be the main thrust of much of the publishing of Catholic texts in English of this pre-famine period and more than likely accounts for the type of religious texts uh, Thomas Sharman was producing in addition to his printing of um, English primers uh, for children. So despite living in a bilingual world, there is no evidence that uh, Sharman spoke Irish um, or printed in Irish. So 12 of Sharman's texts survive um, from, from his printing period. Um, uh, and there are others in libraries in the United States and in England. And this includes the 1825, um, this is the first publication we have from him, um, the Path of Paradise, um, the 1839, the Poor Man's Manual, um, Devotions, um, or the Devout Christian's Daily Companion, uh, Stations of the Cross, Meditations and Prayers, um, and then the, the Devout Christian's Bari Meekin, so a, a, a reference book for, for people to, uh, to refer to and to practice prayers um, um, and hymns on a daily basis. Um, now these volumes are, are mostly quite rough cut, 
um, in terms of the way they're guillotined, perhaps for a less discerning audience uh, and are quite different to the very presentable and well-produced volumes for the county of sizes um, uh, and for other sort of uh, particular publications that you're producing for individuals. The religious texts, they're a type of text, they're instructional, the volumes designed to, to encourage re regular attendance at mass and regular devotions according to orth uh, orthodox and sanctioned uh, church practice. That's about your 10 minutes, Kevin. Thanks, Tom. Now, the Great Famine hit Kilkenny and the surrounding counties particularly hard. Crop failure and resulting starvation saw the large movement of people off the lands and into the towns or wandering in groups along the road. Charles Gavin, Gavin Duffy's description of traveling through Ireland in 1848 with Thomas Carlyle noted the harrowing scenes of the dead and the pauperized population met everywhere along major and minor roads. These were images he said that stayed with him for life. In Kilkenny, there were numerous outdoor relief schemes and of course uh, the uh, county workhouse, a very last resort for the poor because of the high mortality rate which was noted as being one in four. Recent forensic work on the mass burial grounds attached to the Kilkenny workhouse revealed that nearly all those buried in the pits suffered from malnutrition before death. One consequence of the conditions was the outbreak of cholera in mid-1848 in Kilkenny City. Um, the outbreak lasting until the summer of 1849. Charming continued to print uh, through this period and one of his last publications for the 1840s was his pamphlet, uh, was a pamphlet written by uh, Dr. Robert Kane, who was a medical practitioner in Kilkenny, Practical Remarks on Cholera, with an appendix containing sanitary hints for Kilkenny, and published by Sharman in 1849. And at that stage, people weren't, um, weren't fully aware that uh, cholera was a, a waterborne disease. So um, there are lots of very um, uh, unusual recommendations for how to treat um, cholera in Kilkenny in this publication. Now it's one of the, the ironies of Irish history that the demise of, of spoken and written Irish coincided with the rise of physical antiquarianism and the development of, of textual analysis of old, middle and early modern Irish um, literatures. Much of the impulse for this developing from individuals either born or resident in Kilkenny our printer, Thomas Sharman's association with this was as a printer of a major publication, The Antiquities and Scenery of County Kilkenny, um, carried out for a James Robertson, architect and member of the Kilkenny Archaeological Society in 1851. Um, Sharman was also the printer of, uh, for the Literary and Scientific Institution of Kilkenny a denominationally mixed society dedicated to uh, lecturing on the latest advances in chemistry, astronomy, and geology. Um, so quite a, a, a world in which was extreme poverty and, and extreme learning, um, um, a bilingual world, um, and one with, that um, uh, Sharman straddled um, through his printing. Now, in conclusion, we don't yet have sort of further details on Sharman's life, his role, though his role as a skilled printer and his surviving publishing output is significant. He represents an important transitional figure in the printing world of the mid 19th century Ireland. He was well connected across denominational boundaries, a respected community figure, and was associated with some of the major cultural initiatives in English that grew out of Kilkenny in the wake of the Great Famine. As a printer, he was acknowledged as a skilled operator who survived through economically and socially fraught times. Printing for the Catholic Church, the Kilkenny City Corporation, and the developing antiquarian societies in the city. His eldest son, the Maynooth and Rome educated Jesuit John Francis Sherman, uh, was a close associate uh, with the Irish language scribe and teacher John O'Donovan from Kilkenny, and later with the scholar Eugene O'Curry and O'Donovan and O'Curry together transcribed some of the major old and middle Irish texts that contributed directly to the Gaelic revival and then the Irish language leagues of, of the 1890s. Unfortunately, John Sharman, a scholar of some renown who devoted his life to researching the origins of the three Patricks to produce the volume Loca Patriciana, only briefly mentions his printer father. 
but there were obviously shared uh, antiquarian interests between father and son. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop at that point. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kevin. Are you able to? Un yep, perfect. There we go. Um, okay, so we have one question in. Thank. Uh, this is from Anna. Thank you, Kevin. Great to hear more about this area of your research. Though he stayed in Ireland rather than emigrated, as so many of his compatriots did, is there much information about Sharman's ongoing relationship with others in the book trade who did emigrate, such as Shanley? Did Sharman stay in touch with and continue working with Irish diaspora printers and booksellers? Um, at the moment, I don't have any, any information that, that he did. Um, there's no surviving correspondence. There's a little bit of surviving correspondence from James Shanley um, and certainly Shanley's sons who were both printers in uh, Victoria did go back to uh, Tipperary. Um, but um, we don't know at this stage to what extent Sharman was in, in contact with, with local printers. Though, I mean, it's, it's, it's likely that he was. It was such a small world and, um, you know, just 100 metres away from where Sharman was printing in High Street was uh, the premises of John, John O'Daly. He later became a very... Uh, he moved to, to Dublin in 1845 and became a very famous um, bookseller and Irish language printer. Um, yeah, that's all at the moment. Mm, okay. Um, and, and another um, question similar to one that I asked um, Mariam earlier, what, what kind of distribution and, and print runs were these, were these publications um, printed in? Again, again, I don't know. I mean, one of the, the main sort of early bibliographer uh, was a man um, uh, called Robert Dix, um, who in the early, early 20th century began collecting uh, uh, provincial printed uh, volumes, uh, trying to find as many as he could. Um, and the ones that are, that are now housed in the, the National Library in Ireland, um, uh, he remarked when he deposited his, his quite large collection that there were, there were very few that had survived because most of those were, were sort of quite, were very ephemeral. So the, the, the texts that do survive from, from Sharman are, are quality texts or administrative texts mainly. Um, the administrative texts would have been kept uh, locally by various institutions. The religious texts, I'd say, were, uh, they, they wouldn't have been cheap. Um, and they would have had a, I think, a reasonable circulation. I mean, Sharman's name was was reproduced in newspapers around Ireland in the, the mid 19th century. So people knew him as a bookseller to get particular texts. In terms of print runs, we don't know, but obviously he um, uh, economically he was he was secure, much more secure than than the printer James Shanley. That's why the comparison is interesting. Shanley, Shanley went bankrupt three times before um, arriving in Australia, um, uh, whereas Sharman maintained his business and obviously had good connections with um, you know, the local city corporation in Kilkenny. Yeah. Mm -hmm.